Hello listeners, and welcome back to Sandman Stories Presents. Today we are going to be looking at the story of a woman who has a terrible life of being beautiful. Of course, this is a tale from a time that so values beauty that being ugly is almost a punchline in the story. It really gives off it's so hard to be beautiful vibes. At the same time, it explains a farewell that is commonly said in the Azores. And in the second story, a young boy is tricky, but he gets fooled in the end. Okay, let's begin. Linda Branca and her mask. The story of the girl who did not like to be pretty. Long ago there lived a girl who was so pretty that she grew tired of being beautiful and longed to be ugly. She was so attractive that all the young men in the whole city wanted to marry her. Every night, the street in front of her house was full of youths who came to sing beneath her balcony. Linda Branca, that was the girl's name, grew tired of being kept awake nights. It is well enough for a little while to hear songs about one's pearly teeth and snowy arms, one's flashing eyes and waving hair, one's rosebud mouth and fairy-like feet, but a steady diet of it becomes decidedly wearing. I wish I were as homely as that girl who was passing by, she remarked one day. Then I could sleep nights. If I were as ugly looking as that, I'd have a chance to select a really good husband, perhaps. With so many to choose from, it is terribly confusing. I'll never be able to make any choice at all as things are now. I'm afraid I'll die unwedded, she added, as she carefully surveyed the girl's coarse hair, her large feet and hands, her ugly big mouth and ears, and small red-lidded eyes. That girl has a much better chance of a successful marriage than I have, with all this tiresome crowd of suitors to drive me distracted. The girl in the street heard her words and looked up. When she saw how lovely Linda Branca was, she was amazed indeed at the words she had heard. She thought that she must have made a mistake and asked Linda Branca to say it all over again. You can be exactly as homely as I am, declared the girl, when at last she had sufficiently recovered from her surprise to find her tongue. I am an artist. I can prepare a mask for you, which will make you just as ugly as I am. Go on, and make it as fast as you can, cried Linda Branca, clapping her little hands in joy. That evening the suitors in the street under the balcony thought that the lovely Linda Branca had become very gracious. She was frequently seen on the balcony looking eagerly up and down the street as if she was expecting someone. Her dark eyes were sparkling and her fair cheek had a rosy flush upon it which they had never seen before. The beautiful Linda Branca is more charming than ever was the burden of their songs that night. Linda Branca was so excited about her new mask that she could not have slept even if there had been no suitors to disturb her with their songs. When at last she fell asleep towards the morning, it was only to dream that the new mask had the face of a donkey. It was not until the next week that the mask finally arrived. Linda Branca had grown very impatient and was almost in despair lest it should never come. When at last the girl brought it, one could easily see why it had taken a whole week to prepare it. So like a human face it was, that it was obvious that the making of it had called forth great patience and skill as well as necessary time. It is even uglier than I hoped it would be, cried Linda Branca in delight when she saw it. Surely when she tried it on, no one of her suitors would ever have recognized the fair Linda Branca of their songs. Now Linda Branca had no mother, and her father was away on business, so it was an easy matter to prepare her departure. Linda Branca's father was a man of wealth who spared no money in giving his daughter beautiful gowns to enhance her rare beauty. She had one dress of blue trimmed with silver and another of blue embroidered in gold. As she packed up a few belongings to take with her, she decided to add these two favorite garments. Who knows, maybe I may need them sometime, she mused as she rolled them up carefully. With the ugly mask upon her face and dressed in a long dark cloak, she quietly stole out of the house. She went to the king's palace in a neighboring city and inquired if they were in need of a maid. Ask my son. It is he who rules here, said the king's mother. The king looked at Linda Branca with a critical eye. I hired my last servant because she was so pretty, he remarked. I think I'll hire this one because she is so ugly. 
Accordingly, Linda Branca became a servant in the royal palace. She soon discovered, however, that it was a pretty maid who received all the favors. It was good to sleep nights without being disturbed under the songs of suitors under her window. Nevertheless, after a time, Linda Branca could not fail to see that it was the pretty maid who had the happy life. I believe I'd almost be willing to be pretty again, said Linda Branca to herself. Perhaps it has some advantages. She knew very well that the pretty maid was not as tired as she was that night. The next day, there was to be a great feast, which was to last for two days. Linda Branca asked the queen if she might be allowed to attend. Ask my son, said the queen. It is he who rules here. May I go to the feast, asked Linda Branca, when she was shining the king's boots. Look out, or I'll throw my boot at you, said the king. That night when the feast had already begun, she dressed herself carefully in the robe of blue trimmed with silver. It was indeed a pleasure to remove the ugly mask, and find that she was still just as lovely as when the crowds of suitors sang about her great beauty. That night at the feast, everyone talked about the beauty of the mysterious stranger in the dress of blue trimmed with silver. The king himself danced with her. He was completely captivated by her charm. Where do you come from, lovely lady? he asked. I come from the land of the boot, replied Linda Branca with a gay laugh. The king was completely mystified, for he did not know where the land of the boot was. He asked the queen and all the wise men of the court, but there was not a single one of them who had ever heard of that country. The next day they hunted through all the books and all the maps, but there was no book or map which mentioned it. She is the most beautiful maiden I have ever seen, cried the king. I'd like to marry her, but how can I ever see her again if I can't find out the location of the land she comes from? He was in deep despair, and everyone in the royal palace was nearly distracted. It was decidedly embarrassing to have the king fall in love with a stranger from a country nobody could find on a map or in a book. When the king returned from the feast, he saw the ugly little maid he had hired busy at her work about the palace. The next day she again asked the queen's permission to go to the feast that night. Ask my son, was the queen's reply. When Linda Branca asked the king's permission, he replied, Look out, or I'll hit you with my hairbrush. That night Linda Branca again removed her ugly mask and dressed herself in the beautiful gown of blue, embroidered in gold. She was even lovelier than the night before. When she entered the grand ballroom, the king was almost wild with joy. He ran to her side at once and kept dancing with her the entire evening. What country do you come from? he asked again. I am from the land of the hairbrush, replied Linda Branca. Where is that land? asked the king. But Linda Branca would not tell him. Where is the land of the hairbrush? asked the king of the queen mother and of all the wise men of the court. Nobody could tell him, and nobody could find the land of the hairbrush upon any map or in any book. Stupid ones, cried the king. I don't believe you have half tried to find it. He looked through all the maps and books himself, and at last he grew ill from so much studying. His friends all gathered about him in the royal bedchamber and sought to console him. However, he refused consolation. I do not care whether I live or die, he cried. I care for nothing except the beautiful stranger who came to my feast. Linda Branca knew that the king was ill, and when these words were reported to her, she quickly dressed herself in the robe of blue trimmed with silver which she had worn on the first night of the feast. When she took off her ugly mask and looked at herself in the glass, she was really pleased with her reflection. It is not so bad after all to be pretty, she said as she smiled. Linda Branca snuck out of the palace and peeped into the window of the royal bedchamber. One of the king's counselors saw her. Whose lovely face is that at the window? he asked. It is surely the beautiful stranger from the land of the boot, said one. It is the charming maiden from the land of the hairbrush, disputed another. By the time the king himself had reached the window, there was no one to be seen. He called for the queen, his mother. Tell me, mother, who was outside my window a moment ago? he asked. No one, unless a masquerader, replied the queen. The poor queen was nearly worn out with worry over her son. She was afraid he was so sick that he was going to die. The next day the king had in truth grown most decidedly worse. The court physicians went about with anxious faces, and the whole palace had become the place of deepest gloom. 
Linda Branca put on her dress of blue embroidered with gold and again peeped into the window of the royal bedchamber. Now the king had lain upon his richly carved bed with his eyes fixed every moment upon the window where the face had appeared. He did not close his eyes at all. He cannot live long if he keeps this up, said one court physician to another. He had just finished saying these words when the king gave a loud cry and sprang from his bed. He ran to the window and reached it just in time to catch a piece of the skirt of blue embroidered in gold. He held it tight. Masquerader, unmask, he cried. Linda Branca had hastily put on the mask which she had brought with her, and now she looked up at the king with the face of the little servant he had hired. She took off the mask and smiled into his eyes. Now at last I know who is the beautiful stranger from the land of the boot and the land of the hairbrush, cried the king. When Linda Branca had told the king, the queen mother and all the courtiers her whole story, everybody laughed. Whoever before heard of a maiden who wanted to be less beautiful than nature had made her, cried the wise men. I always knew that when my son saw fit to select his bride, he would choose a rare woman, said the queen mother proudly. The king himself did not say a single word, but gazed and gazed at the lovely face of Linda Branca with such joy in his eyes, that she knew in her heart that at last she was glad to be beautiful. Stay pretty is a parting greeting between women in the Azores. Perhaps it was Linda Branca herself who began saying it in the beginning. The End Story number two is about a boy who thinks he's pretty smart, but is outweighed in the end. There is some animal cruelty in this one, so if you want to skip ahead to the end, I understand. Peter of the Pigs The story of a sharp lad and a sharper. Long ago there lived a man who employed a boy to take care of his pigs. The lad's name was Peter, and he was commonly called by everyone in the countryside. Peter of the Pigs. One day a man came up to him and said, Sell me these seven pigs. I can only sell six of them, said Peter. I must keep one, but you may buy the other six if you will cut off their tails and ears and leave them for me. The man promised to do this, and the boy pocketed the money. The six pigs looked sad enough without their tails and ears as they were driven away by their new master. Peter led his one remaining pig down to the sand pit. He buried it halfway in the sand. He buried the tails and ears of the other six pigs too, so that, that part of them stuck out. Then he ran with all speed for his master. Come and help me get the pigs out of the sand pit, he called out. His master ran as fast as he could to the sand pit. There he saw one of the pigs halfway out of the sand. He and Peter together soon pulled it out completely. Then he took hold of the tail nearby. To his horror it appeared to break off in his hand. Run to the house and ask my wife to give you two shovels, cried the owner of the pigs. With these shovels we can dig out the rest of the pigs. The boy ran to the house. He knew that his master kept his money in two big bags. My master says that you shall give me his two money bags, said Peter to his mistress. The woman did not approve of doing this. Are you sure he said both of them? she asked. Yes, both of them, said Peter. Go and ask him yourself. Accordingly, the woman ran out of the house. Did you say both of them? She called to her husband. Yes, both of them, he replied. Be quick about it, too. Of course, the poor man thought that she was asking about the two shovels which he had sent Peter to get. Thus Peter received his master's two bags of money and set out into the world with the bags on his shoulder and his pockets full of the money he had obtained from the sale of the six pigs. After a time, Peter of the pigs met a robber. The robber stole one of his money bags and ran away with it. Peter ran after him. Now it happened that the robber had just killed a deer. He was carrying the liver inside his blouse. As he ran, he threw it back so that he could run faster. Peter saw what he had done. If you want to catch me, you'll have to throw away your liver too, called out the robber over his shoulder. Peter of the pigs pulled out his knife and cut out his liver. Of course, he dropped dead at once. 
When at last Peter's master had found out that he had been deceived, he ran after the lad. As he found him laying dead there by the wayside, he said, Oh, Peter of the pigs, you were sharp, but you found someone who was sharper. Thus it is in life. The End Well, that second story sure had a lot of cutting of things. Uh, I like how the boy was tricky and got the two bags of money, and even had the farmer confirm the two bags, but I was not a fan of the cutting pig's ears and tails, but stories back then were not always for the faint of heart. I did like it in the first story when Linda Branca figured out that sometimes pretty people do have it better, it can be easier for their lives. Also, if you didn't catch it in the name, Linda Branca is beautiful white Portuguese. It also had a bit of a Cinderella vibe with the hidden beauty in the prince. And the podcast shout-out this week is to Spook Central Station. The hosts, Mistress Macabre and Lobotomy Lad, read out creepy stories and investigate mysteries. If you want to watch instead of listen, you can hop over to their YouTube channel as well. They are really swell people who just like a bit of spookiness in their lives. So if you want to be creeped out by some wonderfully eerie stories, go and give them a listen. Sometimes I listen when I want to get a bit of a spine tingle. And if you like them as much as I do, go and give them a review and a rating on iTunes, Podchaser, Good Pods, or Spotify. And the listener shout-out is to Bucharest, Romania. As Anchor isn't giving me any specifics on where people listened in Romania, I'm just going to pick the capital and get to it. Romania is a rather cool country. Its name reflects its history as a place where Romans settled. Probably the most famous resident of Bucharest is Prince Vlad III, also known as the Impaler. Bucharest has been the capital of Romania since 1862, when Moldavia and Wallachia joined up to become the Principality of Romania. And like most places, I would love to go and visit there. Apologies for my Romanian, please bear with me. Multumish si napote buon. Thank you, and good night.